Hey everybody, welcome to our second video here in Humanities 140 World Mythology. So in our first video, you know, we thought about myth, metaphor, and meaning. And mostly the suggestion that the way to approach mythology is, is as a symbolic art form. You know, it's basically stories and images that are, that are masks that stand for deeper hidden things. And the reason we like the myth is because we want to get to those deeper hidden things, not get stuck on the surfaces. So reading myth metaphorically is a crucial skill for us. It's a crucial stance for us going forward, considering all the myths that we're going to be looking at here pretty soon, as soon as we kind of wrap up some of this introductory stuff. And that'll be pretty, pretty shortly. So today I want to follow a thread that Joseph Campbell left for us, something called the four functions of myth. And this great scholar of mythology that we're going to be thinking a lot about, Joseph Campbell, his, his, his suggestion is that, that myths are for something. They have a purpose. Um, in fact, they have four key purposes or functions. They do four things for us. They perform four things for us. And, and uh, let me sketch what those four things are for you. I know you already saw them briefly listed on a page in, in this module, but let me, let me see if we can't flesh it out together here in this video. So the first function of mythology, Campbell calls the metaphysical function or the mystical function. Myths must awaken our sense of wonder. Campbell argues. If the myth doesn't do that, it's not going to be able to deliver anything else. So first and foremost, myths have to sort of dazzle us with awe and wonder and awaken us to the, to the beauties of our existence, to the, to the depth and poignancy of life, of this cosmic struggle and celebration that we find ourselves in. Myth has to do that. It has to sparkle and shine and make us say, wow. And that is really the first thing a myth has to do. And only then can the second and third and fourth functions even start to take shape. But there's a little bit more to this first function, the metaphysical or the mystical function. Campbell also suggests that myths also must help us in this very specific way. They must help us reconcile the horror of the foreground with the underlying beauty of the background. L let me see if I can be clearer about that. I know you've noticed this. And life is hard. Look at it. It's just th this whole biological realm is a lot of killing and eating. It's in violation of core ethics wherever you look. All of this taking of life, putting it in our mouths in order to survive. Look at the whole animal kingdom. It's a lot of treachery and hunting. And it's inescapable. And so in primal culture, in primal hunting culture, you often find that myths serve to sort of frame the act of killing. That if I'm going to hunt and kill an animal, I need to be able to frame that violent, on the surface anyway, cruel act as a necessary phenomena of nature. And that is what the myth must do, Campbell says, is help us reconcile that horror of the foreground with the, with the underlying beauty of of the background that all life is the taking of life. And I'll never forget a beautiful story I read about a Navajo hunter who hunted mule deer and in the American Southwest. And mule deer are great sprinters, but terrible long distance runners. And so this hunter would run after the mule deer deer for hours until the deer got exhausted and then the hunter finally caught up with the doe and put his arm around her throat to begin suffocating her all the while singing into her ear a song a navajo song of gratitude of promise 
a promise to respect her body, to use every fiber to help feed and clothe and house his family, the skin, the sinew, the ligament, the flesh, the blood, the bones that this was a gift received with the utmost humility. And at the last moment when the deer is about to die, he take, the, the hunter takes a little bag of corn pollen off of his belt and puts it over the muzzle of the deer so that its last inhalation is, is, is an infusion of corn pollen, which is the sacred substance of the Navajo religion, like holy water for Catholics. So the entire body of the deer is infused with this sacred substance. There's an example of a ritual killing where it isn't just let's go get some meat because we're hungry. It's this reverent sense that the great mother goddess is feeding us and that the individual animal who is dying is understood as a willing sacrificial victim who comes willingly to keep the people alive. Now, you and I have lost that relationship, those of us that still eat meat. You and I have lost that relationship with meat long ago. We're far removed from the act of killing. We just buy it shrink-wrapped in a styrofoam tray from the supermarket or already cooked from a drive through window. But when you live close to the ground as ancient primal people did, your mythology had to frame that because it's hard to kill. The second function is the cosmological function, the cosmological function. To explain the cosmos and our place in it, to kind of describe all the parts of the cosmos and how they all fit together and how we fit in it. You know, what is the shape of the universe? And, and what do all the different parts mean? And, and so at, this is what the myth also must do, Campbell argues, to portray the cosmos as an interconnected, interdependent, orderly whole, and to delineate our place in it. Like, where do we fit into this? And boy, are we going to run into this a lot in our study of creation stories, of the cosmic myths that we're about to begin reading. So the cosmological function is a really beautiful piece of what a myth must do is simply take us out of the alienation and chaos and bring, it, and bring us into a coherent view of how all the different pieces fit together and how human life is not an alien visitor to this planet or to this ecosphere, but human life is an integral thread in the tapestry of life that matters just as much as everything else. A myth has to do that. And we'll confront many, many myths who do a beautiful job of that. It isn't always the same explanation, right? The Judea, um, let me be more focused. The classic Christian story, its cosmological function is going to be quite different than, say, the Hindu story, where human existence is defined as being in a somewhat different kind of relationship with the all than it is in classic Christianity. So the explanations will vary, but the cosmological function is, is at least the, the presence of some kind of an explanation of how this all fits together. The third function, Campbell argues, that a myth must perform is the sociological function. To establish social and political norms, this is a common dynamic in all world mythology. You know, codes, laws, defining the boundaries of acceptable human behavior. What are the social rules? What are the codes of conduct? What's moral and what's immoral? So it's often the case that a mythology will somehow express and encapsulate what the moral guidelines are, where the boundaries are, what's taboo, and what's allowed, and what's sacred, and what's profane. Uh, this, this sociological function can also bleed over into political structures, right? Some ancient societies, and you could argue this is happening right up to today, um, build their political systems around this cosmological and sociological function. You know, what, who are we in the, in the cosmos? Is are, are human beings in charge of everything? Do we get to rule over the animals? 
or are human beings simply one of the other life forms, brothers and sisters with all life? So those are the kinds of things that come up in both the cosmological and the sociological function. And in fact, for Campbell, today, it is the sociological function that has taken over, uh, especially as we consider the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. You know, the dominant religion in the world is Christianity. And for many Christians, um, there's a lot of emphasis on the, on the law in the Hebrew Bible. What kind of behaviors are allowed? What kind of behaviors are not allowed? And so that's the sociological function. And when you read the Hebrew scriptures, it is just pages and pages and pages of highly detailed law about the governance of every minute aspect of human society. What kind of sexuality is authorized? What kind is, what kind is unauthorized and so on? What kind of food to eat and when and how and where? And so that's the sociological function. Be on the lookout for that. Finally, the fourth function that Campbell draws our attention to, he calls the pedagogical function. And pedagogy is a kind of a clumsy word for teaching. If you want to just call it the teaching function. The pedagogical function is the way myths are designed to impart wisdom, to offer guidance that lead to wisdom, to teach us how to live, to teach us how to live well and lead us through the stages of our lives from dependency to independence, to maturity, to old age, to death. You know, where do you find the owner's manual on how to do this life thing? The owner's manual on how to be a human being. You're born a little infant. You're completely helpless and dependent on powerful others. And then when you're a child, people are feeding you and they're housing you and they're taking care of you and they're defending you and they're protecting you. And then somehow at some point you have to become an adult. And you transition out of dependence to independence. And hopefully as an adult, you become so powerful that a bunch of other people rely on you for their survival. So this is the natural order of things, right? And so in, again, in primal cultures, we often see that the myths, the guiding myths of those people delineate and demark those transitions. Like there's a ritual that tells you you're no longer a girl, you're a woman, you're no longer a boy, you're a man. You know, we don't have those rituals in our culture. Campbell often talks about that. Um, what happens in a culture when there are no shared rituals of transformation from one stage of life to another? Well, we're living in it, right? This is it. And, and not knowing when to set aside the things of childhood and when to take on the things of adulthood um, we learn that from our families, but everybody gets it in different ways and at different times. We don't have a coherent monoculture. We live in a multiculture. So it's fascinating to think of how ancient people did it and then look around and, and, and wonder about how we're doing it or not doing it. So the pedagogical function for Campbell, just to give you his point of view here for a minute as we wrap up, for him of these four functions, again, the metaphysical or mystical function, the cosmological function, the sociological function, and the pedagogical function. For Campbell, it's the pedagogical function that is by far the most important one. And I think he devotes his career to that. In a lot of ways, our course also is sort of shaped around that impulse. David Leeming's book, The World of Myth, deeply influenced by Joseph Campbell's approach to mythology and by his conviction that the real value in studying mythology today for us is that it seems to be the encapsulated wisdom of the best and brightest minds of the past that wrote down their depth insights about what it means to be a human being in this existence, in these amazing creation stories and destruction stories and God and goddess stories and hero's journey stories and sacred place stories and all of it. And when we, with the right preparation, come to the study of mythology, that wisdom becomes available to us. And that is what makes, as Carl Jung argued as well, the study of religion and mythology one of the most important subjects of all according to Jung and Joseph Campbell, 
And maybe you'll come to see some of that value yourself as we go forward through the work that we are about to do. So those, those are the four functions of myth. There's this, just a quick sketch of that. As we go into the mythologies that we're going to be reading, we're going to dip back into this toolkit and, and ask, you know, what, what function is predominant here? Is this mostly a myth about pedagogy, about teaching? Um, is this mostly a myth about sociological function? Um, like the jumping mouse story, for example, that we're going to look at. Uh, which of the four functions do you see most active there? So we'll, we'll reference back to this many, many times. So we'll see you on the other side for the next video. Thanks.